Hello and welcome back everybody to the Quantum Connection podcast and the Enlightened Mood YouTube channel. I am super pleased Vanessa and I are so elated to have Dr. Katherine Clinton here today. She is a naturopathic physician and she specializes in all things quantum biology and also works a lot with, and I saw your published articles, which I can't wait to dive into when I checked out your website recently, Dr. Clinton, and you write about gut health and psychoneuroimmunology and then autoimmune disorders. And yeah, those are all rampant nowadays. So we're so glad and so grateful to have you on. And I know your time is precious and you're very popular. So we're just going to do like a short deep dive today into your um, one of your interests, which is terrain theory. And Vanessa, do you have any particular questions to start us off? Yeah, I just love how you're always like talking about tending to your terrain. And I wanted to just start with how do you help your clients tend to their terrain? Because I feel like, you know, some people get certain diseases and conditions when they're exposed to say mold and some people don't. So mm -hmm. like, what is that? Why is that? Like, to me, I think it's like, depends on the person's as a homeopath, as a person's constitution, it depends on their susceptibility, their genetics, it depends on a lot of things. But um, it also, I really think depends on if you're tending to your terrain and working on increasing your body's energetic potential. So I wanted to pick your brain there. Absolutely. I love talking about terrain theory. And I think that, you know, it's gotten a little, um, what would I say? Uh, it's gotten some different definitions over the last few years, right? With the pandemic. And so traditionally germ theory, like Louis Pasteur and um, the people in his camp really were saying that germs are the cause of the disease, right? One germ caused one disease. Whereas the terrain theory camp, Bachamp and these other people were saying, actually, it's a mixture of your environment. It's a mixture of your internal milieu, right? Of what your internal terrain looks like. And I think that, um, you know, they're really sort of opposite sides of the same coin. And I think it maybe is time to look at some different currency when we're talking about the immune system, because absolutely terrain matters. We know that. We know that having a healthy internal terrain tending to our external terrain as far as toxins go, our relationship with the earth, the sun, all of these things have a massive impact on our immune system, but it's still looking at microbes and that um, whole relationship as sort of this militaristic relationship, right? If we can bolster the defenses, then we can overcome the germs. And I'm the more I look at it, the more I research, I wonder if there's more of a communication happening there where it's not so much um, fighting, but a communication piece. And if that communication network is not in play, then we're going to have problems. And this is not to say that, um, you know, things don't happen because of microbes and our interaction with microbes. They do. And, um, you know, a lot of this talk can like spiral out and all these different things, you know, like microbes don't exist and viruses don't exist and there's no problem ever. And um, sort of this kind of like uh, another camp sort of pushing away the idea that we're mortal, right? Um, we are, we are part of that life cycle, right? We, um, things can happen. We can get sick, diseases happen. But I think when we tend to that energetic potential, then we are really um, looking at that communication network. And actually, I just have a post coming up tomorrow of all about this, because I think that when we have a breakdown in that quantum biological communication network in, in our water body, in our ability to flow electrons and protons in the body, then things become an issue. Right, right, right. So yeah. this is the quantum lens, right? Is that it's not necessarily about all, like we have to be focused on all the particular um, molecules and bacteria, whatever, those kinds of things, which that is important, but it's really about the perspective, the shift in the paradigm is what is our energetic situation? Like how well is our body able to 
function insofar as the signaling. I think that's what you mean by energetic potential. Like what's our electron status? How well is our fascia and our, um, you know, our easy water working to be able to send signals? Is that what you mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we can point to a bunch of different research there, right? Like if you look at uh, tissue stiffness and dehydration and how that adds to disease state, or if you actually just look at a cell, um, there's been research showing that a healthy cell has that robust, thick, structured water, crystalline water, easy water, whatever you want to call it, that's lining the cell and inside the cell, right? And just for a little bit of background, um, which I'm sure your viewers know, but just as a reminder, that structured water is um, was first discovered or identified really by Gerald Pollack and his team out of the University of Washington, where those hydrogens are becoming more tightly bound and they create sort of this lattice. He proposes a hexagonal shape, which I really identify with because of that benzene ring that's so populous in our body, melanin and our neurotransmitters and hormones. And that creates this sort of um, lattice like a like a honeycomb and as one sheet of this structured water forms against our cells our hydrophilic water loving uh, surfaces in the body our vessels our cells our tissues it creates a template for more sheets to form and really the stimulate for that is infrared energy, right? And and the sun is the, okay. our biggest source of infrared energy. Yeah, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> and well, that. Because our listeners are still, you know, we're relatively new, so 27th episode, I think. So it's always good to reiterate over and over. That's how we learn, right? So, and the, the main point is, is that this is not the bulk water that comes out of your tap that's unstructured because of how it's been manipulated. And that uh, we're so deficient in sunlight that our water are the special crystalline water that you're speaking about. It, we, we are deficient in that. Is that how you describe it or another way? Yeah, absolutely. We're deficient in it from all of the sources really of infrared energy, movement, um, love, snuggling, all of these things, right? Um, create that infrared input that builds that structured water. And as it builds, it creates that proton wire or that proton rich zone. It's being called in the research. And just like a nine volt battery, it creates that separation of charge. And Pollock in the lab found that it was enough to light an LED light bulb. So it's certainly enough to help power things in the body, which he also found as well. And so you know, when you're looking at a healthy cell, you see that rich structured water on the outside on the inside of the cell. Whereas if you were to look at a cancerous cell, you see a quite diminished structured water on the outside and inside it's bulk water. It's not this um, different phase of water that we're talking about right now. And so you have this idea that, you know, this evidence that there's a real difference between healthy and sick cells, depending on that structured water capacity. Wow. Yeah. So much ama amazing. Like it sounds magical. It almost sounds, that's the quantum piece, right? It's like, what is all this stuff happening? Right. And mm -hmm. then the mitochondria aren't able to make the cytochrome C oxidase. Is that right? And then they can't make the structured water because there's other factors that compromise mitochondrial function. So it's like all these environmental inputs, are they good? Are they bad? And that's the mission we all have is to educate people about what exactly is attending to, to your terrain. What are you exposing yourself to? There's good frequencies, bad frequencies, right? There's sunlight and then there's other things that can dehydrate you. So it, there's a lot of factors, but the thing is, is that it doesn't have to be that complicated. We just need to help people understand what's going on. Right. Absolutely. I mean, just on a really simple level, you know, getting back to that question, how do you help your patients tend their terrain? I 
I kind of fire hose them with evidence, right? So they <laughs> hop on board, right? Because it can kind of sound like, oh, this one is down some crazy rabbit hole, right? So I spend a good amount of time in that first visit, just giving them a lot of research, a lot of evidence. And then I pull it back and say, what really this is showing us is that a lot of things in our modern day life, our chemicals, our pesticides, toxins in our food, our lighting, our, our temperature, our divorce from the natural world has caused an imbalance in that terrain. It has caused just this um, overabundance of influx of unnatural stimulants, right? Whereas if we are to tend to our terrain, a simple thing to keep in mind is that that's walking back to those relationships that we evolved with over millennia, right? Our relationship with the earth, the dirt beneath our feet, um, the nature, the uh, seasons, the temperature of the seasonal flux in your um, environment, the rhythm of the sun, right? That's huge. So I usually give my patients um, generally across the board two um, scripts that are pretty inclusive of everybody, right? Every disease is individual. Um, so there's always some individual component, but most of my patients walk away with a, a discussion of how they need to align with the sun, right? And that means getting up, seeing that AM sun, getting that natural light in the morning so that it can trigger all of those biochemical processes in the body. And and that starts with that quantum interaction with those photons of light, you know, tunneling in through our um, mitochondria and our retina, our skin, and really initiating those biochemical processes, those that dumping of dopamine, serotonin, cortisol, all of these things that we need to get going in the morning. And then there's some kind of um, talk about maintaining a little bit of natural light in our uh, throughout the day. And of course, safe natural light, because um, when we get a lot of sun damage that degrades our collagen networks, maybe we could talk about that next time. Um, that's sort of another whole fascial um, terrain and how to tend to that. But we, of course, we don't want to overdo it and get sunburns. But um, getting that natural light throughout the day kind of resets us and maintains those hormonal levels, um, those neurochemical levels. And then at night, when we see the sunset and we lower our lights in our houses to match that, then we're really going with that yin yang flux of daylight and darkness that our body needs, right? So each, almost every cell in our body has a circadian clock. And, you know, there's other, um, triggers, right? Eating is a big one. Um, being active and social is another one, but predominantly across the board, the main one is light. And so getting that natural light sets us up with that rhythm that our body should be in. And, you know, when you think about almost every cell in our body having a circadian clock, that means that almost every process is circadian. Digestion, right. respiration, cardiovascular, our detox pathways, our hormones, inflammation, I mean, da, 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 da. It's all really set up with the circadian rhythm. So I really talk with my patients about aligning with the sun and getting that relationship sort of dialed in. And I'm here in the Pacific Northwest and we just turned our clocks back. So it gets dark at five. Um, and we aren't bumping into each other in the dark. You know, I have two kids um, and <laughs> they, they're they not down for, for darkness at five. So we transition to lights that don't disrupt that um, transformation, that conversion of serotonin to melatonin. And melatonin really is helping with that repair, scavenging those uh, cells that become cancerous and defective. And it's really important. It's our, it's our master sort of antioxidant, right? And 
And so we transitioned to incandescent lights, to uh, salt lamps. We have multiple little clip-on um, non-blue lights that they can use for art projects or drawing or reading or, or games, you know, for playing a board game. We kind of each have our clippable lights on so we can see. Um, and and they're used to it, right? The first year this happened, there was a lot of, nope, turn that off, you know, <laughs> nope, nope. Um, and it actually wasn't um, easy, right? Because that's why we're in this predicament. It's easy to live in bright lights. It's easy to look at our screens. It's so habitual to really... Um, lean on these conveniences. It's easy to live in 70 degrees all year long, right? And and now my kids know that that we get cold when we go on a walk at first, and then our body starts warming up. But if it's winter and it's cold out, it's good to feel the cold. And when it's hot out, it's good to sweat and feel that heat, that infrared, right? So it's, it's really becoming... Um, you know, in tune with your environment because it is such a massive player in how our our rhythms and our biology works. You know, we're not that far off from plants and, and we need that relationship. I love how you describe it. I, and I want to give you space to ask questions on this. I'm so excited to talk to Dr. Clinton. <laughs> just one thing I wanted to say about when you describe it as a relationship, like that just feels so um, like nourishing and it kind of brought up a, a, this idea of that we are disconnected and then we don't have the intimacy with nature, right? We're not interacting with nature in a deeper, more meaningful, right? More tactile way with the exposure in our senses, the cold, the light, the heat, right? And that is, it's just like a relationship. If we don't have that intimacy, right? We don't know how to, how to connect that way with a person, there's going to be negative um, things that happen, right? And so if we don't know how to have that kind of relationship with nature, there's going to be consequences. So anyways, I just brought up that idea for me. Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm talking about, you know, this checklist that I give my patients, but I know because it was the same for me, right? I was diagnosed with two um, autoimmune conditions and Lyme disease. And so I had this checklist, you know, go see the morning sun and go ground barefoot. And, you know, it was this checklist that was a chore that I was doing to get better. And eventually it opened up this relationship where I find safety, I find a sense of belonging with my relationship with the sun, with my relationship with the world around me. And I think when we're talking about chronic disease, one of the major obstacles that my patients and myself saw and are seeing now is you can't heal if you don't feel safe. That nervous system piece is so huge when it comes to healing. And to be able to find safety in a patch of grass or a tree or the rising and setting of the sun is such beautiful medicine. It's such a beautiful relationship that we've always had had and we've just walked away from that. And so giving that relationship back walking back to that relationship, returning to that is such powerful medicine. Yeah. I always say nature is the parasympathetic. It's like the best, really. <laughs> I love that. I love the way you explain it. It's so beautiful. And I want to say, what do you see, you know, um, what kind of conditions do you see improve by using quantum biology strategies with your clients? So just so people have that idea. Absolutely. Um, I see a lot of autoimmune conditions and GI conditions because that's what I had. <laughs> so I became sort of focused on that in school. And so I see those things um, really benefit from this. But like I said, a lot of... Um, people come in with nervous system dysregulation. Almost all of the patients I see do. So that's a big component as well. And of course, I've seen cardiovascular patients and um, acute illnesses that also benefit from this because it's just 
foundational to our biology, right? So I think you could bring in um, a, a cardiologist, you could bring in an endocrinologist, you could bring in, you know, all these different ists, <laughs> you know, specialists, and everyone would report if they're using this, um, some benefits to doing this, because it's not condition specific, it's human specific. And so if you're dealing with humans, then it's going to relate to what they're dealing with. Yeah, it's the way we're supposed to be living, right? Just connecting back to nature. And that is, I always say, circadian biology, quantum biology, whatever you want to call it, is the foundation to living an optimal life. And whatever the disease, no matter the disease or the condition, this is going to help you improve your life. So I love that. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it's going to decrease your susceptibility to everything else, to any like to gaining any chronic diseases to in the future. So, so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no. And I think that also it opens up a window to an understanding of our world where we can't just boil things down to a chemical reaction, right? There is this flow of energy that's coming. Um, and this starts to sound woo, but it's really not, right? It's it's science. We have this cosmic radiation hitting our ionosphere, being transferred into lightning, replenishing that negative charge. And that flow of photonic information of, of electrons, all of that is being flowed from every plant and animal and human on this planet. So we are really healthiest when we are standing in that flow of energy. And when we realize that we understand the importance of tending to that greater terrain and really standing up to the powers that be and saying, no, we can't, no, we're not going to colonize Mars. We need to take care of the planet we're on, right? We need to, we don't end at the barriers of our skin. We're all involved in this. And what matters is this relationship we have with with nature and the things within nature and that flow of energy and so I think I love quantum biology in that aspect too because everything we have in medicine is so reductionistic right and it reduces it down to these um, chemical reactions chemical mechanical reactions whereas quantum biology reduces it down even further but once you're at that level on that quantum biological that nano sized level you start to see the that the lines start to really blur, right? Like there's this interconnection that happens across the board. And it's really a beautiful thing to um, appreciate and tend to. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. I love that. So great. Thank you so much for that explanation. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Heather, any other questions you have for Dr. Clinton? I know we're getting towards the end of her time and I want to be respectful of that. So thank you so much for joining us. But uh, Heather, do you have another question? No, go for it. Vanessa, I know you have a, you have more. Uh, I wanted to, we don't really have a lot of time to dig into this, but I wanted to know how like the emotional trauma is affecting the terrain also. Um, so that was my other question. So I don't know if you can dig into that quickly, but um, I, I find that a lot of people, like you said, they have nervous system dysregulation and it's usually connected some sort, to some sort of emotional trauma. And I wanted to know how that affects the terrain. So maybe you could dig into that for the last couple of minutes. That would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we should do a part two because this one is really fascinating and, and it has such a big impact, right? Like you mentioned the, the articles I wrote, um, boy, that was a while ago <laughs> on, um, um, these journal articles about psychoneuroimmunology, because that's really where I got my start with quantum biology. It was like, oh, wow, this isn't all chemical mechanical like we've learned in school. There's something going on with um, frequency, with vibration, with the synchronicity we have between the way our biology works and our thoughts, right? And so one of my favorite articles um, written by Martin Picard was on emotions and how they impact mitochondrial health. And I mean, we can dive into fascia and, and the biofeed and all of these, you know, the magnetic field and, and heart coherence. I mean, there's so much really to unpack here, but, but just starting with that, starting with the, the impact that an emotional state 
can have on our mitochondrial function, meaning that those more positive uh, emotions, those more meditative and uh, coherent emotions of gratitude and love having an impact on increasing the ATP production in our mitochondria is just mind blowing, right? And the opposite being true, right? And so there you have something that is opening up a window to how emotions really impact our our quantum biological state, that flow of electrons and protons through the electron transport chain. And that gets into... Um, you know, epigenetics as well, and how these things can be passed on generationally. And so, I mean, man, that opens up so many different windows and avenues to talk about, but it's not just this chemical mechanical model. And, and that chemical mechanical model is based on randomness, right? It's based on random collision. It's based on random mutations. It's just sort of like, um, 97% of our DNA is junk DNA. Hey, we don't know what it does. So it's junk. Um, just that hubris of science to just sort of dismiss what we don't understand. Right. And when it comes to um, that mechanical chemical model, it only explains so much. Right. And when you get down to this, this flow of, of quantum particles, then you can really start to understand what's happening and, and how it gives rise to those chemical mechanical things that we see. Right. It's not like the receptor lock model is wrong. That does happen, but what initiates it, it doesn't seem to be randomness. And that makes so much more more sense. And it gives such a better foundation of explanation and understanding to our epigenetics and why um, our, our stress response is passed on generations and generations. I think, I, you know, I think we're at 21 generations now, you know, we went up from 14 to 21. So it's really this, um, and as a homeopath, I mean, we could talk about miasms and, and those fields of resonance, you know, morphic resonant fields and, and how these magnetic EMF or maybe something that we have pinned down yet, um, because they seem like the biofields seem to not just be EMF, um, including EMF, but not solely, right? There's something else happening there. And it's just absolutely incredible. And so to kind of bring it back to what you were asking me, those emotions and that sense of um, trauma that a person can have absolutely impacts our current state of biology when the trauma happens, when that, you know, insult, emotional insult happens, and it can stick with us for generations. And so really coming to a full understanding of that is really important in medicine, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. I think that it's like, I think about it, Dr. Clinton, as our mission, like Vanessa and I want to bring truth, right? And you speak that you just there's just so much love that you exude it makes me just like feel so safe even listening to you right so i think the, that our greater mission could be that as we bring the message of quantum biology we're actually helping to create more coherence globally and right cosmically and because of how much as everyone's aware of right the things that happen in the world that to me is a is a reflection of all of the in, I don't know dysregulation or incoherence. I don't know the right words, but so helping to cultivate safety and understanding and the love that comes with that coherence, right? That's the beauty of it all. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, um, with the current state of the world, I've been talking a lot about this um, coherence, and and it isn't this idea that that we look away from the tragedies, that we look away from the devastation happening. It's the idea that 
we can hold those human emotions. We can hold rage. We can hold, you know, drop to your knees, wailing, sobbing, sorrow. We can hold these big human emotions and hold them in a state of coherence where we're not putting that on other people. We are not aggressive and reactionary with those emotions. We can hold that and at the same time be in state of coherence. We're able to communicate that, that anger, that frustration, that sorrow in a state where we are still coherent. And, and that gets back to the work of HeartMath Institute and a lot of what they've done, the research showing how our heart and our um, brain link through the nervous system. And I think the fascial network too, how that regulates our coherence and allows us to walk with sort of this grace, right? Um, allowing us to be human, to feel all those emotions, to walk with those emotions. It's not about not being human and being a guru on top of a mountain and, and not aware of anything that's happening and disconnected. And I don't feel emotion when I see all these things happening. No, it's about feeling those emotions and being coherent enough to walk with them, to take action, to take the action you see needed to change the world and for a better place, right? And and that's really what coherence is talking about. And I can't wait for part two because <laughs> <laughs> that's so much right there to talk about. Um, yes. but yeah, so, I agree. I love it. I love it. I love how you said not to like, to let the emotions out, not to suppress it, right? I think that's so huge. I think a lot of, I know you have to go, but I know a lot of us do that. They're like, oh, we can't feel, you know, we just repress it down. And then what is that doing to our body? You know, it's causing issues. So I love that as beautiful way to end. And we really appreciate your time. And thank you so much for coming on Dr. Clinton. And we'd love to have a part two. So we'd be oh, yeah. honored. Yeah. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on and doing what you guys are doing. Um, we need more voices in this arena for sure. So thank you so much. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye, Dr. Clinton. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, you guys. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you.